Abraham Newman, and I'm the director of the Mortara Center here at Georgetown, and I am thrilled to uh, start up again our GPEP-R series, which is a year-long series exploring the intersection of race and international political economy issues. Um, I want to start just by acknowledging um, that Georgetown's success today is in part the product of the contributions of enslaved peoples, and uh, we want to recognize that. And if you're interested to know more about the role that slavery played in Georgetown's history, um, it is a key kind of um, issue that Georgetown is actively engaged with currently. I'm going to put in the chat uh, for everyone you can see more about Georgetown's uh, coming to terms with slavery uh, at this website. So welcome today to the a conversation on race and international issues related to foreign aid. We have two um, amazing experts with us joining us in the conversation. We have Burju Bayram, who is an assistant professor at the University of Arkansas. Um, she is doing exciting research at the intersection of, I would say, uh, political psychology and international relations. And we also have JP Singh, who is a professor in, uh, in international commerce and policy at the Skushar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And uh, Professor Singh, or I'll just call him JP, I think that's okay, um, ha, you know, has had a multi-decade career investigating issues at the intersection of trade, the global south, and actually issues of services and the services trade. So with that, I want to bring our conversation to a start. I'm going to hand over um, first uh, to Bershu and then to JP. Each will give 10 minutes uh, roughly presentation and then we'll have an open discussion. I'll first ask some questions and then we will uh, invite questions from the audience. I would say if you're interested in joining the conversation, please register your comments in uh, the Q&A function, and then I will bring those to the speaker's attention when we get to the discussion portion of the show. Okay, I kind of feel like and in DC, we have this, you know, Kojo Namdi. I feel like I'm Kojo Namdi right here. Um, I wish I could be. I wish I could be him. Um, anyway, so with that, I will hand it over to our speakers first. Bershu. Oh, I think you are muted. It's our terrible virtual life. Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Abe. I'm very excited to be part of this larger project and to have the opportunity to talk about race and foreign aid today. Uh, my expertise is in foreign development aid. So uh, I will focus my remarks more on foreign development aid and I think it will work very well with our other speaker because he will take a broader view. Um, questions of race, paternalism, colonialism are not new in uh, foreign aid and development research. Um, for a long time, political scientists, anthropologists, critical race scholars have acknowledged that the notion of foreign aid, in fact, is tainted by racism and colonialism and that the do-gooder white, typically men, aids the poor people of color. Um, and then progress is measured by yardsticks imposed by Western standards. Um, but with the momentum created by the global Black Lives Movement today, we have a new uh, and refreshing discussions among scholars and practitioners. We are increasingly more self-critical, reflective of our own positionality, and conscientious about what our findings and research mean for anti-racism uh, and foreign aid. Um, and the big question is really, how do we decouple whiteness and typically heterosexual maleness from aid and development and break existing power relations? Um, let me share my screen. Uh, I wanna highlight three dimensions of this um, new momentum. Hang on, am I sharing my screen? Yes, okay, good. I wanna highlight the three dimensions of this new momentum today. Um, anti-racist narratives in aid, anti-racist policies and anti-racist organizations. Um, we do know that donors still view aid from a rather paternalistic perspective. Uh, 2015 research by Andy Baker found this uh, that uh, donors, especially donor publics, view uh, recipients of African descent from a paternalistic 
uh, view and they don't see them as having agency and capacity. Uh, my 2019 research with Marcus Holmes, again, unfortunately showed that racially charged stereotypical images um, are, hang on, ah, racially charged stereotypical images are um, very much appealing to people still. And this is kind of what motivates people to give. Um, they call this uh, pornography of poverty, which is racist, paternalistic, and reinforces stereotypes. It's this use of extremely negative and graphic imagery that characterizes recipients of aid as helpless, devoid of agency. This still sells. So the question is, how do we educate people and how to sever this connection? Um, and doing so really has two related components. Change the image of recipients, uh, change the image of recipient governments as well, and then change the image of aid altogether. Um, from a scholarly perspective, changing the image of recipients has really two dimensions. When and why do people respond to racist and paternalistic versus anti-racist depictions of aid recipients? Uh, my current research with Todd Shields explores these issues. And what we're finding is that personalization matters. Uh, people respond to um, non-racist, non-paternalistic images when they feel a personal connection, both to the recipients and to outcomes of eight. Um, so one thing here to do, for instance, don't just show a picture, even if it's a positive picture of a person, but rather um, tell us about this person, their name, their age, their family history, um, what they're doing today. Also connect the recipient, connect the donors to aid outcomes. Uh, don't just talk about uh, this aid in terms of GDP, but talk about the $50 from somebody's annual income or $30 that might go to aid where they can make a difference. Um, for those interested more from an advocacy perspective rather than a policy, a scholarly perspective, a wonderful advocacy practitioner groups are doing important work. Africa No Filter, uh, Population Works Africa, for example, are all trying to move from Afro-positive, uh, Afro-progress narratives and move away from this pornographic images of disease, poverty-ridden Africa that is harmful. Um, and I think these kinds of advocacy groups will benefit more from using our scholarly insights on personalizing aid. Um, changing the image of recipients is partly related to changing the image of aid altogether. We got a, we have an opportunity here with the Black Lives Matter movement globally to make development aid anti-racist and get rid of the white gaze and the colonial past um, by probably paying attention to global solidarity. Um, and this is not just fluffy language. This is in fact happening um, actually on the ground. The French Development Agency for its 2018-20 strategy, 22 strategy, got rid of the world development and aid altogether and instead replaced that with investing in global solidarity in a common world. So valuable research area in this regard is when and why do some donor governments move away from this aid and development framework to a global solidarity framework? Um, why was the French Development Agency able and willing to do this, uh, whereas the USAID wasn't? Um, a really important thing is also changing the image of recipient governments that we have. Unfortunately, uh, donors uh, seriously think that aid is wasted. Um, a really extreme example of this is that Senator Rand Paul thought that 30, 70% of aid to Africa, for example, were all wasted. Um, this is empirically not true. And a really cool book about this is economist Charles Kenny's book that shows that the evidence for this kind of corruption is not there, but this is the image people have of governments of colored populations. Again, my research with Marcus Holmes shows that um, when the foreign aid recipient is a country that is a white Eastern European country, um, people are willing to compromise on aid effectiveness and conditionality and cut the recipient government slack 
but they don't do the same thing when you have a government to a colored population that is an African government. Um, so a fertile research area for the future is again, is what kind of information about recipient governments uh, changes their image uh, in donors' eyes? Um, here, uh, I have some research going on this and what we're seeing is that um, we have to bring them into the conversation uh, into development narratives, into aid narratives as partners, not as recipients, as partners. Um, the next dimension is related to uh, anti-racist policies. Uh, what we know is that leadership positions are generally in the development world and foreign aid world staffed by uh, white men from Europe and North America. Um, real partnership, however, requires bringing the local experts and leaders as equal partners at the table and giving them real decision-making roles. Uh, if you look at the OECD's Development Assistance Committee, for example, um, they are uh, members of uh, rich donors, often men and white men, and they are deciding um, what is development, what is poverty, how much money is going to go, how our funds are going to be allocated. Um, the, all those funds are administered through a culture of uh, compliance and monitoring. And since the uh, 90s, um, earmarking of aid, in fact, has increased, whereas donors really decide uh, which pet projects they're going to fund. And that has made a aid even more um, paternalistic. Um, and a topic I'm exploring in my current book project is helping relations as power relations paradigm. Um, that when and why do donors go for dependency reinforcing policies? Um, such as conditionality, such as traditional funds, when do they go for autonomy reinforcing policies where you actually train the local expert and you use their expertise to create new policy or even more simpler policies such as cash transfer uh, to which conditionality is not as seriously attached. Um, other really good ways uh, to explore where, where we can have autonomy reinforcing aid is to look at not North-South cooperation, but look at South-South cooperation where we see more empowering and agentic policies. Um, and I will end it with a third slide, uh, third topic. Um, this research for this has to go to more to public policy folks, but I will be remiss if I not mention this. Uh, we do know there is a systemic racism and inequality in foreign aid organizations and in the overarching aid sector. Um, just recently, Government of Accountability Office said that within USAID, uh, minorities are 30% less likely to be uh, promoted. Um, so the, the aid organizations, whether at the governmental level or international organization level, such as the OECD, World Bank, um, have to really clean their own house and think more uh, critically about um, how they can diversify uh, their workforce and, and systemic racism. So I will end this with that and I'm excited for more questions and comments. Thank you. Wonderful, those were great uh, initial comments to get the conversation going. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to JP. JP, you are muted right now. Oh, right. The number one mistake I always make. Um, thank you so much, Abe, for fostering these conversations. And thank you also to uh, your co-conspirator, uh, Professor McNamara, for doing so. Uh, you've invited me several times to Mortara Center. And it's just a pleasure to be here. And I was so engrossed in Bushu's uh, comments that I kind of forgot that I was going to be speaking. Um, but here we are. I'm going to be speaking of racism, paternalism, trade, and foreign aid. Abe, your comment about how Georgetown has a past that's rooted in slavery, uh, I just thought was 
you know, it, 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 it was a sentimental start and it's about our affinities for each other and our affinities with history. And my slide here is one such affinity of history where the word Jagannath for Krishna is being translated as Jagannath, which still belongs in the English language. And, and it's about these natives hurling themselves against these, these huge chariots that are coming down. Uh, not very different from the comment that was recently reported about um, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, talking about uh, animals in Africa or uh, 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 Donald Trump speaking of the global south and African countries as shithole countries or animals or the Valladolid debates which took place in the 16th century where the natives were savages. Uh, so Franz Fanon says that to speak is to assume civilization. So my question is, what's the civilization that international relations has presented? I won't go into details here, but I would argue that the civilization that we presented in international relations, those of global orders, et cetera, has been one which has silenced people about questions of race. A lot has been written about those silences. I want to speak about two of those silences today, which may help to maintain uh, a certain uh, degree of, 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 of not dealing and grappling with race issues in international relations. I'll mention two, one is hierarchy, the other one is paternalism. Both of these are presented as benevolent notions from the global north about those who are at the bottom of the hierarchy or recipients of foreign aid, etc. cetera. And, and these are supposed to be good for the global order, but also good for those at the bottom of the hierarchy. So that's the wisdom that I'm questioning in this. I will begin with an anecdote. And that anecdote has to do with the $300 million of foreign aid that the United States provided to Brazil in 2014, settling a long running dispute at the WTO for 12 years, which Brazil won because it produces cotton competitively. The foreign aid that the United States gave to settle that dispute uh, was in lieu of actually opening up its foreign market, uh, sorry, its cotton market. Uh, instead, what that foreign aid was supposed to do was to help the Brazilians grow their cotton better. Now, you, I'm sure you can understand the inanity of giving a country foreign aid to help it grow its cotton better when they've already won a dispute at the World Trade Organization, which shows they're very competitive. We had done the same thing earlier in 2004, by we, I mean the United States. We'd done the same thing in 2004 earlier when the C4 countries, Benin, Burkina, Faso, Chad, Mali stood up at the WTO um, in, uh, ministerial in Cancun and asked for cotton barriers in the United States to be taken down. The United States instead gave them $16 million of foreign aid. So uh, there is a connection between foreign aid and trade that I hope to be able to make in what I'm presenting in the next few minutes. And I hopefully will be able to make that connection, not just in terms of the sort of trade-offs that I'm hinting at, but to root it in paternalism and racism from, from, the, <clears throat> from the global north. Uh, I wrote a book called Sweet Talk, Paternalism and Collective Action in North-South Trade Relations. And one of the important things there is perhaps captured in this economist story, which says America and Europe are forever lecturing developing countries about the need to open their markets, yet they do their best to keep out many poor country exports. Uh, let me just uh, say what I mean by paternalism here. Paternalism for me takes the form of foreign aid, side payments, moralistic, preachy statement, trade capacity building assistance, affixing developing world and dependency narratives, whereas a position of equality would be negotiated, negotiated trade liberalization concessions. Since I'm making the connection here with foreign aid, I also want to remind us of what exactly is this, this foreign aid. There are various estimates, but here's one taken from uh, what my co-panelist was referring to, the DAC committee at OECD. As you can notice, most of the countries do not meet the 0.7% target uh, of, of providing foreign aid as percentage of global, uh, gross national income. United States is about one sixth of 1%. It's very, very small. Even if in total absolute terms, United States is providing close to 35 billion 
uh, dollars. That, by the way, uh, this here's what, what you can see over the years what it is. If you want to get an estimate or, or want to get your head wrapped on how much is $140 billion, uh, it's less than uh, uh, it, it's it's less than 10% of the stimulus package being proposed for a year uh, in the United States Congress right now for the pandemic. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also 100 times the total revenues of Georgetown University in the year uh, 2019. Uh, other countries have caught up to uh, United States in terms of total foreign aid. The DAC, of course, doesn't have figures for China, uh, but those would be very high uh, right now. So that's what we are talking about. We're not talking about a whole lot of money, yet we have, I think, part of the racism of international relations is never acknowledging what a small amount we are talking about. I think that's probably, I would relate that at some level to the chip on the shoulder we have about helping the developing world so much and, and how uh, uh, and whether this aid does effectiveness or not. I think somewhere along the way, we need to reckon with how small that amount is. Let me now try to make the connection with trade. This perfect hyperbola, what is pointing out during for the Uruguay round of trade talks, which took place under the predecessor to the World Trade Organization, is showing you that those countries which are receiving this official development assistance do not receive agricultural trade concessions. Okay, right now, there are farmer protests going on in India. Agriculture remains a very important industry for the developing world. Uh, this is not causation. Yet. This is, all this is showing is that countries that receive development assistance do not receive any trade concessions. So how should I go around making the argument that this is, in fact, a trade-off? And two, that perhaps it's more than just a coincidence that these things are happening together. There are various ways of doing it. I realize there are... Uh, many undergrads here as well. I just wanted to go briefly over. If you take up research like this, there are many ways of doing it. You can do historical process tracing, cotton, sugar. These are industries which enslaved people, shipped them across countries. You can do that historical process tracing. And even if people don't are imbibing that narrative about slavery, think about what has substantively changed in terms of the conditions of the people who are growing sugarcane or growing cotton, whether it's in Chad or it's in Brazil. You can do structured focus comparisons. Uh, is India's outsourcing industry subjected to the same type of discourse as, for example, Canada's is or Ireland is? You can show actually it isn't. India is uh, uh, its outsourcing industry often is the recipient of a lot of racist rhetoric, whereas we barely notice that there are more outsourced jobs to Ireland and, and uh, Canada. Uh, you can do content analysis. You can do quantitative techniques. In the interest of time, I'm mostly going to focus focus on the fourth quantitative techniques over here uh, and a little bit of content analysis. Uh, through a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, I got all the US uh, TR press, press releases from 1982 to 1995, and of which there were 1,462, of which seven, 710 made paternalistic references towards other countries. 93% of those were towards non-OECD countries. So at first glance, when we choose to be paternalistic, for example, in this case from the United States, it's mostly towards the global south. But then can I show that this paternalism is related to lack of trade concessions that the developing world gets? And also, uh, what's the role of foreign aid in this? So I'm going to move towards that. What I did was to uh, construct a paternalism strength index, taking into account a host of economic, political, and cultural indices, which behaviorally would tell us something about North-South uh, relations. For example, the economic index that I took into account was the, uh, uh, the export diversity index towards number of countries and number of trading partners, the assumption being that in a typical colonial relationship, you have one master to which you export one product, whereas if you're diversified and you have many partners, that means that you have moved away from a typical colonial relationship. So I took a host of these, these indices and I did factor analysis, which allowed allows us to get to latent factors that might be informing those indices across the board, and I constructed a paternalism strength index. These results here show the results of interacting or seeing the common effect of paternalism and foreign aid. If you run your eyes down to the third uh, variable listed on the right, that's the in 
interaction effect or the common effect of foreign aid and paternalism, what it's showing is that uh, when the two interact, developing countries get, and this is shown in a statistically significant way here, less concessions. This is over and above the kinds of factors that we often take into account in trade theory, which have to do with the prosperity of a country or uh, politi political pluralism, in other words, domestic factors as we speak of uh, in, in the developing world. So foreign aid and paternalism taken together result in less concessions for the developing world. This is in the case of agriculture. And here it's in the case of manufacturing. I have similar results, uh, no matter whichever sector I run into, uh, developing countries get punished at trade rounds for if if they if, as they become recipients of foreign aid or in one case and one might say recipients of paternalism so what do i conclude for, from this paternalism which hobson et al have argued is just the post war equivalent of racism is a reward for good behavior or hush monies like i showed you or brazil etc or they or we make carve outs in 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 uh, um, uh, trade terms, we have done this sort of handouts to the developing world, which are called generalized system of preferences and limited number of concessions. So that's what paternalism yields the developing world and along with foreign aid. Uh, I've also been able to show in my analysis that you're punished if you're a colony, you're also punished if you're a coalition. This, by the way, I would relate to just our everyday common sense. We do not like uppity minorities or uppity women for that, whether they're in academia or otherwise, and they get punished. And so North-South relationships are no different. Uh, hard fought gains from developing worlds are portrayed as made through dependent and inferior countries. And uh, all of these questions, as I said at the very beginning, they, they, uh, uh, they question the positive benefits for the developing world from paternalism or uh, hierarchy. Uh, you know, Frederick Douglass once said, power doesn't concede anything without demands. And I hope that the analyses like we are beginning to do in international relations will be part of those demands that we're beginning to make uh, to make the world a better place. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks to both of our speakers uh, for great comments. Also for staying in their time allotment, which never happens. So uh, everybody gets a here. I don't know if anybody can see. Oh, I don't have the reactions on this version of Zoom. You know, I want to put up my exploding, um, uh, the one that's like an exploding party. Um, but before I ask uh, a first question, I just wanted to call on all our participants uh, to please, if you have questions, to put them in the Q&A function, and then I will start, um, you know, posing those to our speakers. <clears throat> I wanted to start um, with this conversation that I think both of you are touching on which is the question of um, deservingness, you know, that frame which foreign aid is often pitched in, which is also in domestic, you know, when we talk about redistribution in general, it, in domestic politics, it's often pitched in this kind of, you know, who's deserving of this effort. And I'd like you to kind of just think about how that has to be reframed in light of an anti-racism agenda. You know, um, Bersha, you, you talked a little bit about solidarity and um, uh, JP, you talked about kind of ending this paternalism. And so I'm just kind of thinking of like, as we, we're gonna have major challenges where people are gonna need help. So if it's like climate change or um, new issues that have to do with inequality, both internally and internationally. And so how can we change this from a deservingness kind of conversation to a different type of conversation? Um, and then the other thing I wanted you to maybe just think about is, how our standard practice in foreign aid is really undermining these goals, the goal to moving to solidarity. Um, and so I'm just thinking about, you know, things like benchmarking or things like, you know, some of the things that JP uh, raised, like in trade negotiations, we often create special status for poorer countries. But what does that special status mean? They don't get to participate in the actual concessions. They, they have to go into, they're shunted into these area, these other programs. So if you can just think about the, the actual institutions that perpetuate kind of repression within this effort that's supposed to be, um, or you would hope would be the opposite. So those are kind of my first two. Um, choose either one, you don't need to answer all of them. You know, just pick something that that, that stimulated. 
JP, I started first with the remarks. You take this one first, I'll jump in after. All right, thank you, I will. So in terms of uh, deservingness, that's by, by the way why I'm questioning uh, these models of paternalism because I think they perpetuate that ideology of inequality and, and make uh, the developed world feel uh, uh, very good about itself, about something that's actually a very small part of these interactions. That's why I wanted to throw up those figures. Um, so the way to move forward beyond that deservingness, and I couldn't agree more with Bursh Bayram's research on participatory development, uh, because we need the world to be turned upside down. And we're beginning to see that happen most effectively in, in uh, uh, development efforts, and I don't mean north-south development efforts, I just mean development efforts, period. Most of the participatory development is not coming about because the World Bank said so, or DFID or USAID said so, but because that's where development has gone. And so whether you're doing randomized control trials or you're doing community participation, it's already happening. So uh, I, I think that's, that's a way to speak of agency and voice of the people, to let them name their world as Paulo Freire would say it, and then otherwise. Uh, how are standard practices in foreign aid undermining this? I've already sort of uh, you know, hinted at that along, along the way. I think they create a dependency narrative and, and a position of inferiority. You know, Terry and Srinivasan in the 1960s when the globalized, uh, sorry, the generalized system of preferences was created, was said, instead of demanding and receiving crumbs from the rich man's table, such as GSP and a permanent status of inferiority under the special and differential treatment cause, had they participated fully, vigorously on equal terms with the developed countries in the GATT and had they adopted an outward oriented development strategy, they could have achieved far faster and uh, better growth. Now, one might say that's speaking about neoliberalism, but what Srinivas and Bhagwati and many other economists and developing countries negotiators have pointed out is we want to play in an equal playing field. And no matter what the trade theory might be, even new, new trade theory would say, Brazil is a major player in cotton. They're developing countries which are major players in sugar. They do not need these crumbs from the rich man's table. And what's holding them back is not what trade theory would predict, but what I would say is what paternalism and, and racism uh, predicts in this case. Um, the, so therefore, the, the share of the developing world, and especially the least developed countries, has not gone up in, 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 in global trade, as one might have expected, especially given their uh, comparative advantage or given the size of their uh, markets, etc. Great, Bruce. All right, I'll I'll just add a couple of things. Um, I Please. agree with these are really really important comments. I think the notion of deservingness. Um, I think we need to teach donors, both those at the public level, at the mass level, and at the decision making level, at the executive level. We really have to teach donors that uh, there is a reason why we need aid in the first place today. Right. There is a certain history and certain power dynamics that necessitated aid and that kind of contributes to, to poverty and underdevelopment and this whole notion of global south in the first place. Um, this is not sort of a phenomenon out of the blue, right? This is in fact uh, related to the history of colonialism and imperialism um, and, uh, and, and whiteness. So this, and there are certain power imbalances. Um, I think understanding you know how we can move on to a deserving this a global solidarity frame and then we can think about this as investment and capacity building and equal partnership for all really first understand requires understanding and coming to terms with that history um, and how are we can change our institutions practices subsequently, I think it's really two things are important. Um, people who are the so-called recipients of aid, and by the way, mind you, some scholars and uh, critical race scholars, uh, some advocacy groups are saying, you got to get rid of this donor aid terminology altogether. Uh, I don't know a better terminology right now, but um, I should bring it up that some people are saying that terminology itself is um, paternalistic and imbibe these issues of racism and colonialism. But um, 
once we under once we have donors understand that there is a history of colonialism and in power relations that perpetuate sort of this imbalances, uh, our institutional practices will change. And changing that, I think, has two components. One, the people who are the recipients, um, they have to be at the decision making table. They have to be at the big negotiations, uh, voicing their concerns, not just as takers, but by putting input. Um, and that requires sort of changing that mindset of these do-gooder donors are uh, providing aid, right? And the second of all is uh, earmarking of aid is really not benefiting anybody. I mean, my research with Aram Graham shows this. First of all, we show since the 1980s, right, there has been this increased um, earmarking of aid of both at the bilateral level and at the multilateral level, whereas the donors are deciding increasingly which programs they want to fund and which programs they don't want to fund. This by default means uh, recipients can participate um, and they don't have much of a voice. So this is, uh, I think, another key issue in changing our institutional practices. Great. OK, we have a whole bunch of questions that are popping up. So I'm going to group them into kind of similar like questions. Um, before I do that, I just want to underscore what Bershu just said is that I think the typical way we understand foreign aid is like, oh, this country lacks institutional capacity, or this country doesn't have a productive resource that they can, you know, it's like they, they don't have a comparative advantage. But it, it begs the question, why don't they have a comparative advantage? Or why do they have weak institutional capacity? Or why do they, you know, all these different things. And, you know, I think exactly what you're saying, which is like, well, because of colonialism, because of, you know, racism, there are these underlying forces that put these, you know, sliced up these societies in these particular ways that gave them disadvantages that then have undermined their ability to, you know, it's not the, I don't want to say that this is the only thing going on, but like, that we uh, we whitewash all of that, you know, it's like that didn't even happen. And then we just start from the, well, it must be about their primary education levels. And so we need to start with this question, you know, anyway. And it's also about what we think about what JP said was like how, what the size of foreign aid should be. If we think we're just trying to address, you know, like making sure people don't live in poverty. But if we're trying to address historical injustice, it's a very different conversation about what the appropriate level of input should be by these different actors. Anyway, so I just wanted to, I thought that was a, uh, the way you said it was excellent and I just want to underscore. Okay. Just to underscore one more thing about this. I mean, um, some of these advocacy degrees I've looked at, I was at an OECD development communication workshop and uh, people were saying, what we need to do is to stop thinking in terms of development, which means let me build you some roads and dams and give you some vaccines and educate your population. But rather, we have to think about social justice for everybody, right? And that's a much broader concept. So I think your last remark was really on point. Great. OK, so um, the first comment I want is there's several people who are raising a question about, is this a Western problem? Uh, or is it more universal? And they're they're targeting this question of China. So as China rises as a player in foreign aid, do they just, is it something about foreign aid that is the problem? Or is it something about the donor who is the problem? And will, you know, one question is, how might the racialized nature of foreign aid change with China and other actors coming to the fore in this space? That was uh, Kate McNamara had that question. And there was another question, which was, do you think that paternalism and racism is an inherently North white problem? Or when and if China or other emerging economies become world leaders, do you think they could sh also show attitudes uh, in a similar vein? That was Sergio uh, Urias. So I just think that that's a really important kind of, you know, is this just the white man's problem? Or is this more universal? And will we see other biases um, and paternalistic or also hierarchical frames being used when other great powers rise. How do you want to go, Abe? <laughs> I'm happy. Whoever wants to, just just you can unmute. Just let's have a conversation. You know All what right. I mean? Like, well, uh, okay, I'll go again. I'm sorry that then I I I, I, I had unmuted myself. I just wanted to call. 
attention to uh, people like Shashi Tharoor and others, you know, powerful public intellectuals from the global south talking about reparation payment. Uh, so Abe, just to your point earlier about how much is the size of the foreign aid, people like Shashi Tharoor and all have said the global north owes trillions and trillions of dollars uh, towards the global south. Um, is this a problem for just North-South alone. There are two ways of looking at that question. One is to say, all countries do this. I hope that we are not thinking about the fact that don't you have problems of your own? Uh, I, was, I was once making a presentation on Sweet Talk and uh, I was just shocked. A scholar just said, uh, but doesn't India have its own problems? In other words, this is some way of deflecting against those problems. And the answer there is scholarship. Look, uh, there are comparativists dealing with other problems. And we are. I'm trying to explain my dependent variables. My puzzle here is, did racism and paternalism affect North-South trade relations? And I'll leave it to uh, comparativists to talk about caste in India or gender in Brazil or ethnicity in Africa. So yes, of course, we have a host of problems. It's really sort of surprising that if a person was presenting some Thing on the United States, we won't ask them those kinds of questions. But doesn't the United States internally have, you know, a problem which is unrelated to the dependent variable that person has? But I think there's something to, I, I puzzle about why are we asked that question a lot when we present North South? Is there some fighting back against how dare you tell the North this is done when you've got your own problem? So I just wanted to kind of bring that up, even if that's not how that question was 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 meant. Um, the China question is very hard to answer because in a way I've answered it. Yes, of course, China and India could also act. In, in fact, right now, the FDI going into Africa, for example, the num it's number one China, number two India, and number three United States. Okay? So the patterns have changed. And if you looked at those data from 20 years ago, uh, United States would have been there. Now, the question is, is that carrying uh, similar assumptions of paternalism, racism, you know already that the way African students have been treated in China or the way African leaders have been treated in, in China or the way India has behaved in Uganda or Kenya and, and we have histories of that. Of course that exists. And, in, in, uh, and, and uh, previous speakers that you had, uh, um, Zoltan Burzis in particular has, has, has written about racisms in East Asia. Uh, which have affected. So yes, they are. And that just means we have a lot more work to do. And, uh, uh, but in this particular case, we're just speaking of, you know, North South relations, I, I don't have concrete evidence here to present uh, against uh, the proposition that China uh, is also uh, following similar maxims, but I take it at its face value, that's an important question to ask. Um, agreed. It's a definitely important question. I guess there are two ways to look at it, right? Um, one is we can empirically examine South-South cooperation and see if it is less paternalistic. We can do the research, right? Over time in certain issue areas, is North-South cooperation more paternalistic than South-South cooperation? And then try to understand why. Um, I don't have like GP, I don't have the perfect answer for that. I just, somebody has to go do the research. Maybe we should do that, right? Um, that would be a wonderful question. And if that's Kathleen McNamara's question, I'll be love to co collaborate with her. Uh, we can all do something. Um, and then there is a more of a theoretical question and I will put my political psychology hat here. Um, is this a white man's problem? The, in the form that it is today, yes because it is tied to colonialism and racism and imperialism. But is it inevitably a white man's problem? Probably no. And this is where the psychology aspect comes in. Um, maybe there is always a, some, some sort of degree of paternalism and outgrouping and inferiority thing in any giving or helping relationship, especially if it is institutionalized. Not that me helping a stranger on the street who just fell, but if somebody is um, helping with somebody's you know, survival on a long, over a period of time, that relationship might turn into a paternalistic relationship. So I guess another, I approach this from a research perspective, we can ask, 
at what point do these various giving relationships that may not be um, originally tainted by colonialism turn into more paternalistic relations? We can also examine that from a time series perspective, right? And look at what's the time, how long does it take? Um, so it could be a you know Western white man's problem, but it doesn't have to be. And it's really an empirical question when, under what conditions. Great. Okay, so I have seven, I'm gonna pick apart several questions that were opened on the Q&A that I think they get to the question of, uh, the puzzle is why do people still give foreign aid if it's detrimental to the recipients, if it creates dependencies and you know those kinds of issues, slash is there something about capitalism or power that requires foreign aid? Do they, that foreign aid and racism and capitalism go together for another objective than just helping? So, you know, it's, it's a contra, or, you know, it's, Bershu is kind of suggesting that hierarchies or dependent or, or um, structural power emanates from a helping relationship. This, this question is, is there something else going on? Is the, is the goal not to help? Is the goal something else? And we've, you know, we've gauzed over that with this language um, to mean something else. So I just, um, I'm, I, there's three or four people who have raised this issue. So I don't think I'm gonna just read their question, but that, that's, I think the gist of it is, if, if it's not helping, what is it doing? And could it be, there's something else going on that's connected to the interrelationship between capitalism and racism? do you want to yeah i was trying to unmute myself oh yeah um so a lot of these advocacy groups that i like to uh keep an eye out and look what they're doing and there have been some just advocacy based uh race and development and aid kind of um workshops, uh, all Zoom workshops, any for anybody to attend, if you just would Google them. Um, but I think one thing that I learned from them, and this is my personal conviction too, is that the problem is not so much aid that is detrimental, but the manner in which it's distributed and in which it's given. Um, as long as we have uh, these all-knowing, all-omnipresent, all-powerful donors deciding what is poverty, where is aid needed, how much money, to whom, through what mechanisms, and then in turn put the recipient side um, in a position of uh, compliance and monitoring, how are you using our aid, so that, that kind of relationship, then aid will be detrimental because it will perpetuate the existing power imbalances. Um, so it's not so much the aid, but the system in which it's given and distributed um, without remedying um, the imbalances of power that exists. Um, whether there is something else going on, whether capitalism globally could be a factor, I don't know. I don't want to bring out, you know, uh, Wallerstein and Marx and Prebish and everybody else that we know in, in political economy. Um, it could be, maybe, maybe uh, global capitalism requires a system where, um, you know, through certain mechanisms, we, we keep certain countries um, in a position of dependency. It's, it's possible. It's possible. Um, but I think another part of this is that, and I have sort of an interesting research on this. Um, if you ask people, what, why are some, people, some countries in the global south poor? Is it because they're lazy? What do you think? Is it because they lack resources? Is it imperialism? Um, just what's your perception of it? People also typically go to lack of resources. And this might be true in some cases, like certain parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and not in other cases, um, but uh, lack of resources might be another factor alongside of capitalism, I would say. Um, I'll turn a little to JP. Thank you for that. Um, to the first part about why do people still give foreign aid, Abe, that's a really important question to us. And surprisingly, foreign aid literatures didn't begin to ask that until 20 years ago, because most of the foreign aid literature was uh, was towards the effectiveness of foreign aid, or it was about recipients and their characteristics and their capacity to do things with foreign aid. 
And that, that's another silence because it was people like Karen Lancaster, in fact, from School of Foreign Service and others who broke that silence and said, this is why foreign aid is given. She gives a historical analysis of how it was strategic foreign aid in the post-war era. And so donor interest, now we won't know deeply about motivations, but we can calculate donor interest. And that's where I see Bushrose and other people's research fitting in along with Milner, Tingley, others were beginning to look at what are the donor interests and why do they give foreign aid? And, and it's tied up with a whole uh, host of factors. And what I'm trying to add to that conversation, many of us, is that part of that has to do with uh, donor interest in maintaining paternalism and maintaining racism, which is what paternalism is, is resting upon. In terms of, is it something about capitalist and capitalism and, and I would say international liberalism that requires foreign aid? I'm going to give an unconventional answer. And it's based on uh, my belief that markets are good. Okay, I'm just going to throw this out there uh, because I think it be, that's another conversation we need to have. Oftentimes people assume that if you are speaking against racism, you must be, in the words of many people these days, a radical socialist. And they also assume that if the, the, the global south stands up for itself, they're also radical socialists. Uh, they're not. They're looking for resources. They're looking for trade concessions. Brazil was not saying throw down the global liberal order. It was saying tear down your tariffs. Uh, and so uh, empirically, I don't see that the developing world is, is making calls for radical socialism. Uh, Normatively, I, I've tried to situate my research in theories of moral sentiments about how we speak, what are our civilizational codes, et cetera, how we interact with each other and, and break down capitalism and international liberal order into exchange. And that's why my dependent variable is, is there reciprocity in trade relations? Because that's the international legal principle. I'm very interested in to what extent is reciprocity on it. Now, one could still come back and say, well, we don't need international liberal reciprocity. Uh, we need a socialist revolution. Uh, in other places, I've tried to answer that. But I would say at the, very, at the end of the day, that's, that's your point of entry. You have to decide where you're coming into it. I'm coming into it with a belief in the market system uh, broken down to, to, to sort of the micro level of exchange at, at interpersonal uh, relations and moral sentiments and at the uh, global level of, of liberalism. Great. Um, so now, you know, I, I want to move the conversation a little bit into, um, I'll call it like the, uh, like, a positive, you know, we're transitioning to the end of our conversations. I want to move into this kind of like, where's the hope for change or for renewal? And there are several questions that are around this. Um, so um, Andrew Go, he he asks, um, are there if we change the imagery around the recipients, are there specific types of changes in the in the types of aid and how it's being given? Um, Olivia Rutazibwa, she asks about the French example that Bershug offered, and is, is it just discourse or is there actually like policy changes that are also happening or reflected in it? Um, and then I think there was another question about um, the liberal order, I'm, I can't find the exact one, I just remember reading it, about how the institutions of the liberal order, the World Bank, the IMF, the traditional kind of standard bearers of this, is it possible to renew them in this exercise or do we have to you know get rid of scrape down those institutions that start with new ones and what would they look like okay so those that's a lot of stuff and obviously you can't answer everything but if you want to take a piece of that um, in this conversation all right i'll i'll start uh take a couple of them um thank you for these questions these are just wonderful questions um i'll start with olivia's question uh, like is the French uh, agency's um, new narrative actually meaningful or is it real policy change or rhetoric? And they are not the only ones. Uh, there is some movement towards this notion of let's invest in global solidarity. Um, and this was really the main point of conversation uh, at the OECD's development communication um, network that I attended um, and really loved. Um, Part of it is real policy change. For example, they are rethinking conditionality, uh, moving more towards cash transfers, uh, trying to work with the local uh, experts, local leaders. Uh, there is certainly some of 
that. Um, is all of it real radical policy change? Not yet, because just by changing your narrative, you're not gonna overnight change all of your policies. But I think it is an important step uh, towards the right direction. Um, with that said, we also need to be careful with this, this notion of investing, right? Because for global solidarity, because um, with the rise of populist uh, politics, right, populist groups, we're also seeing this foreign aid as investment uh, on the other side, whereas foreign aid as investment, not so much to help, but rather to stop refugees and migrants to our countries. So for self-interest, uh, we also have to be careful in the rhetoric there. Could be foreign aid as investment, for self-interest of countries or for um, global solidarity and uh, sort of world partnership. We see that some of this in uh, the French agency, in the Swiss agency, in the Norwegian agency, no surprise, right? Always the Nordic countries. Um, but these are steps in the right direction, uh, but not 100% uh, policy change yet. We do know that as well. I'll take the imagery question as well. What kind of imagery do we need? Because this is what I'm living and breeding these days. Um, first of all, we need uh, hope-based positive images and move away from this pornography of poverty thing altogether. But we can't be all fluffy about this either, right? Um, because people sense that and they actually don't react to fluffy, positive and happy images as well. And also, um, is some some research shows us that when you go uh, tell people, look, UNICEF gave fifty bucks to this family in um, you know or this refugee family, uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon, and now their lives are so much better. Actually, this is paternalistic as well. So we need the different image of the recipients, um, not as like fluffy hope stories, but. Um, have them talk about their hopes, dreams, what they want their children to become, right? Um, the real thing that like, we feel or we think about. Also, uh, rethink the images that we attach to outcomes of aid. Aid should not be this, hey, because of what UNICEF did or USAID did, now these children are alive, isn't that wonderful? But maybe make it more nuanced, more subtle, put it in context, right? Um, and a final point is that it has to be also more personalized. Um, personalized, not again in a fluffy way, but in the sense that this was this person, this is their personal family. So my research with Todd looks at this. Uh, we're looking at um, information about people's names and age and their backgrounds, what happened to their parents, how do they make the journey from, you know, uh, say Myanmar to a refugee camp in Bangladesh. Um, these kinds of details actually make them more human in the eyes of givers. Um, that is also important. And um, I'll let the, the military aid and the economic aid parts uh, to uh, JP. But these are wonderful questions, thank you. They really are, and this last bit is uh, kind of hard to answer. I see change happening at three levels. Uh, one would be those who really believe in white supremacy. Are they going to stand down? No, there's a standoff. They're not going to stand on. Uh, they've wielded arms and, and, and they're willing to do anything to maintain that ideology. Yesterday's image in the Washington Post on the homepage or the front page was uh, of a black woman confronting a white supremacist uh, 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 person in Florida and all the black uh, uh, protesters got arrested and the white supremacists weren't. But uh, I just thought that image in a way was telling because for the first time, I, I can't see how the rest of the world, and I'll go so far as to say if somebody did content analysis of that image, stupidity on one side and somebody standing up for herself on the other side. So that's one part. The other one could be a moderate conversation about internal reform, the moderate liberals like all of us here at some level, <laughs> amending our ways, doing the research, slowly prodding along and hoping it'll speak to the margins. Uh, and the third conversation would be, um, you know, the current structures are not changing, so people take charge and 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 they form new structures, uh, new institutions. And in a way, that's for me where international development seems to be going now in participatory development and in the ways that people are taking charge of their destinies. Uh, the, any which way you look at it, there is an elephant in the room, and that's populism. And uh, 
and it's not just in 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 uh, in in the United States. It's also there in India. It's also there in Turkey. It's also there in several other places around the world, which is affecting the way that uh, you know the moderate measures or the measures from below uh, would would get um, arbitrated. So. Um, in, in terms of, I think, the middle, there is a, a lot of opportunity to, to grow that conversation and, and to join with those people on the, on the ground. Um, I do see these conversations happening, like Bursha and several others perhaps in this room. We've been invited into quarters to talk about racism where we thought it would never happen. I was asked to write a policy paper for the World Bank on what would they need to do to deal with racist measures. I've, you know, I've been writing for the British Council, which uh, you know, they would maintain that they're a cultural relations organization, but they do get ODA from DFID. And, and so, and the conversations have been all about culture. And at some point they stopped me and said, no, we want you to talk about paternalism. And the fear is that uh, you might get co-opted into that conversation and say, well, now we've got, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so speaking of paternalism and therefore we're doing it better. But I also felt there's also a sincere exploration uh, what do we do? But in the same way that Georgetown now is having these conversations, and Abe and, and, and you ref reflected on the past, so I think there is an opportunity to grow that mid-level conversation too. And so, if there was a strategy here for the future, it would be sort of the bottom-up conversations that are happening and the mid-level conversations that are happening. It's too early to tell if we could then defeat the white supremacy conversations on the other flank. But you know, social movement theory used to say that once you've got these radical flanks, people move in the middle. We no longer believe in that uh, because the middle seems to be shrinking. <laughs> but, but, you know, hope spring eternal and hopefully it'll begin to gain traction again. Wonderful. Well, we are now at our hour, which um, I can't believe it was like a perfect end to the conversation. Um, I, I just want to um, put up in the chat for all the attendees, we have um, videos of these talks and all the past talks are present there on our YouTube channel and we will post this talk soon. Um, our next uh, installment will be on February 18th with Sonal Pandya and she'll be talking about the relationship between race and foreign direct investment. So Bershu, JP, thanks again for an amazing conversation. I know that um, our panelists, there were a lot of reactions and people saying what a wonderful conversation this was. So thank you again for coming. Thank you thank so you much. Bershu. Thanks. It's a okay. pleasure to be on the panel with you, Bershu. Yeah, likewise. It was wonderful. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, all the attendees. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. <laughs>